Hello, this is Dr. Gonday. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jessica O'Grady? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, I'm happy to announce my new TV show, Criminal Psyche with Dr. Todd Grande, is now live on the Roku channel. Tune into Mysteria, channel 548, to watch me explore the psychology behind the most shocking true crime cases. There are a few ways to watch it for free. You can visit the RokuChannel.com and search Mysteria, get the Roku Channel app on your smart TV, or if you have a Roku stick, head over to channel 548 on the live TV guide. In addition, I will put the link to the Mysteria channel in the description for this video. Moving back to the case of Jessica O'Grady, first I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Jessica O'Grady was born in 1986 and lived in Omaha, Nebraska. In 2004, she graduated from Westside High School. Jessica moved into an apartment with two friends, Holly and Tracy. She attended the University of Nebraska and worked part-time at a Lone Star Steakhouse in West Omaha. Jessica was majoring in education and wanted to be a school teacher. But in the spring of 2006, she was rethinking her college plans. She wasn't sure if she wanted to return for the fall semester. Jessica dated a man named Christopher McClanathan. He had been convicted of offenses related to sex and was considered high risk to reoffend. The couple eventually separated. Jessica's friends were relieved by her decision, but they did not know that Jessica would find an even worse Christopher. One of Jessica's co-workers at the steakhouse was a man named Christopher Edwards. He went by the name Chris. Jessica made it clear to Chris that she was available. People described their interactions as flirtatious. The couple started a sexual relationship. Jessica came to believe that she was pregnant and that Chris was the father. What Jessica did not know is that Chris was active in another romantic relationship with a woman named Michelle. Michelle became pregnant with his child sometime around January 2006. Chris had decided that he wanted to stay with Michelle. He was not interested in Jessica for a long-term relationship. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Tuesday, May 9, 2006, Chris spent the night at Jessica's apartment. The next day, Wednesday, May 10, Jessica's roommates, Holly and Tracy, saw Jessica at their apartment during the evening. Jessica was sending and receiving text messages. She talked to her roommates about Chris. Sometime before 11 p.m., Jessica received a phone call. After this, she took a shower, fixed her hair, and applied makeup. Sometime between 11 and 11.15 p.m., she left her apartment. On her way out, she told Holly and Tracy to wish her luck. She was going to Chris's residence and would see them later. Chris lived about eight miles away, in his aunt's house. He had a room in the basement. At 11.29 p.m., Jessica called a friend of hers named Carrie. Jessica told Carrie that she was in her vehicle on her way to Chris's residence. Jessica called Chris at 11.48 p.m. What they talked about is unknown. About 32 minutes later, Carrie received a text message from Jessica's phone, which read, no shenanigans for Jessica. This was code that meant no sex for Jessica. Evidently, Jessica was looking for sex and was disappointed because it did not happen. Carrie did not reply to this message. The next day, Carrie, Holly, and Jessica's aunt, Shauna Stansel, all tried to reach Jessica without success. Shauna's husband contacted the police on Friday, May 12, to report Jessica missing. On Sunday, May 14, Jessica failed to appear at a softball game, at this point, her aunt Shauna and some of Jessica's friends met at Jessica's apartment. They found that her cat and her personal belongings were still there. Jessica was known to care very deeply for her cat and would feed her every day. Shauna also visited the steakhouse where Jessica worked. She discovered that Jessica failed to collect her last paycheck. Chris was at the restaurant. He told Shauna that he had not heard from Jessica since May 9. They planned to get together on May 10, but he canceled the arrangement. In addition to Jessica's friends and family, the police were becoming concerned. 
Here's what law enforcement found during their investigation. Other than an automatic recurring charge, the last time Jessica's bank account was accessed was on May 10. Jessica's cell phone records showed that she was highly active, both making and receiving calls every day. After the text message she sent to Carrie at about 12.20 a.m. on May 11, all activity stopped. On May 16, Jessica's gray Hyundai accent was found not far from the steakhouse where she worked. The police spoke to Chris. He told them essentially the same thing he told Jessica's aunt. He was supposed to meet with Jessica, but he canceled the plan. He called her and sent her a text message on May 10, advising her of this cancellation. Chris mentioned that Jessica thought that she was pregnant. He was not convinced that he was the father. The police checked out Chris's story and discovered that he did not call or text Jessica on May 10. He sent a text to her on May 11, wondering why she did not come over to his residence. It was almost like Chris was trying to set up his story. He was puzzled by Jessica not showing up. Apparently, Chris forgot about this effort when he told other people that he canceled the plans. The police obtained a search warrant for the house where Chris lived. In his basement bedroom, the police found quite a bit of blood. It was on the headboard, the ceiling above the bed, the top of the mattress, the bottom of the mattress, two of the walls, a clock radio, a nightstand, bedding, a bookcase, a laundry basket, a chair, and on a short sword in his closet. In Chris's motor vehicle, the police found blood in the trunk and on the handle of garden shears. A shovel was also found in his vehicle. In the garage, the police found a bag containing two towels with blood on them. The lab eventually determined that almost all of the blood belonged to Jessica O'Grady. So much blood had been deposited on the mattress and in other places that Jessica could not have survived. In the bag with the towels, the police found a receipt from a Walgreens in Omaha. In a surveillance video from that store, Chris could be seen buying shoe polish, correction fluid, and poster paint on May 11 at 7.41 p.m. The paint was a match to paint found on Chris's ceiling. It appears as though he tried to cover up the blood with poster paint. The police seized a laptop computer that belonged to Chris. He searched for the word arteries and viewed a diagram of the human arterial system on May 9 at 2.26 p.m., the day before Jessica left her apartment to visit him. Chris was charged with murder in the second degree and the use of a deadly weapon to commit a felony. He was convicted of both charges and sentenced to 80 years to life in prison for the murder charge and 20 years in prison for the deadly weapon charge. The sentences were to run consecutively. So he has to serve 100 years to life. Now moving to my analysis. Christopher Edwards has maintained his innocence. He was offered a plea deal. If he revealed the location of Jessica's body, he could plead guilty to manslaughter. Inexplicably, he refused the deal. Chris appealed his conviction, claiming that the state did not have enough evidence to prove that Jessica was murdered. It's not clear if Chris really understood how guilty he looked. The authorities never found Jessica's body, but there is no doubt that Chris murdered her. Even if Chris could argue that the blood loss Jessica sustained was insufficient to cause death, what alternate story would he have people believe? Why was there blood all over his bedroom, on the towels, in a bag in the garage, and in his vehicle? I suppose Chris could argue something like this. Jessica came by his apartment. When she was on the bed, he stabbed her with a sword. He didn't mean to kill her. It was a series of accidents that happened over the course of several minutes. He just couldn't stop unintentionally stabbing her. There was blood spatter everywhere, and the mattress was soaked with blood, but Jessica did not die. Instead, she patched herself up with towels and had a philosophical conversation with Chris. She said something like, All this stabbing has made me reevaluate my life. I think that I'm going to run off and start a new life without any money and without communicating with anybody that I know. I would like to do some gardening before starting my new life, so I will need garden shears and a shovel. Before Jessica ran off into the night and disappeared forever, she wanted to get some sleep. The mattress was a little messy because of the stabbing part. Therefore, she decided to rest for a few minutes in the trunk 
of Chris's vehicle. The idea that Chris would try to convince people of this ridiculous narrative reveals a lot about his low level of insight. He has no ability to see himself as other people see him. He has no empathy. It is impossible to believe that Chris did not murder Jessica. Chris should have taken the manslaughter plea deal. It was a very generous offer to him, considering the circumstances. Moving to the last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Jessica liked children and wanted to be a school teacher. However, she became sidetracked after having a few romantic relationships. Jessica confused sex with love. She became highly attached to her romantic partners and was interested in a long-term relationship. She was second-guessing the college route and leaning toward finding a lover and getting married. Jessica's heavy investment in romance and feelings that she believed were love made it impossible for her to see that Chris was simply using her. From his point of view, the relationship was only about sex. He was not interested in Jessica as a long-term partner. Chris wanted to be with his other lover, Michelle. After learning that Jessica believed she was pregnant, Chris had mixed feelings. He wanted to continue to have sex with Jessica as long as he could get away with it, but he also did not want to be with Jessica. Chris was going back and forth as far as his emotions. He did not know what to do, but felt as though he needed to do something. He was not willing to let the situation play out. When Jessica came over to Chris's residence on May 10, she wanted to have sex, but he was in more of a homicidal mood. He could not figure out how to extricate himself from the situation and was becoming increasingly angry. Chris decided to commit murder. He waited for Jessica to fall asleep on his bed and then stabbed her with his sword. Chris had absolutely no idea where to go from here. He did not know how to get away with the homicide. Despite only weighing 130 pounds, Chris managed to move Jessica's body to the trunk of his vehicle. Based on residue left on the shovel, Chris probably buried her body somewhere near water. Chris made a clumsy effort to clean up the crime scene, but left blood everywhere. He went to Walgreens to buy supplies that he thought would help him to hide the blood, including whiteout. He was treating the homicide like a grammatical mistake on an old typewriter. No amount of correction fluid was going to prevent Chris from being in a correctional facility. The same impulsivity and lack of common sense that facilitated the murder contributed to a terrible crime scene cleanup effort. After Chris was arrested, he had a chance to avoid life in prison with a plea deal, but he was too arrogant to admit guilt. Furthermore, Chris probably believed that he deserved to kill Jessica. He may have rationalized that she was trying to trap him by getting pregnant. It's not actually clear whether Jessica was pregnant or not. And if she was, some people believe that Chris was not the father. Chris had a very dangerous combination of traits that led him to being a killer. He was irrational, irresponsible, aggressive, and impulsive. He lacked empathy, and lack remorse. Chris attempted to be charismatic and was manipulative in an obvious way. Unfortunately for Jessica, she was too inexperienced to identify Chris as hazardous. She did not know what to look for as far as danger signs. She was in a vulnerable state. She was looking for one true love, somebody to sweep her off her feet. To her, sex was an indicator of a long-term commitment. To Chris, sex didn't mean anything. Jessica found herself attracted to the wrong person. Instead of a caring, pro-social individual, she discovered an awkward, creepy, inept, and sadistic killer. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jessica O'Grady. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.